thing out there. Good. Good. <laughs> so I'm going to start with a little quiz. How many of you have heard of Zanzibar? Oh God. <laughs> How many of you know where Zanzibar is? That's okay. <laughs> okay, closer to home. In the last couple of months, how many of you have seen a woman over the age of 70 on primetime TV or in a lead role in a film or on a main stage anywhere? One. <laughs> okay, how many of you have seen a woman over the age of 60? 50? 40? And no, Michelle Obama does not count. <laughs> okay, that's a, a little better. There are actually no women over the age of 40 in leading roles on primetime TV series. And the, the spaces in which women occupy public spotlights over a certain age in the Western world are just ridiculously tiny. And a couple of years ago, I was in Zanzibar, which is a tiny island in the Indian Ocean off the coast of East Africa. It's where my father was born. And I saw this extraordinary performer called B. Kidude. She is 95 years old. She claims to be 120. She was born in the poorest segment of Zanzibari society, um, an African Muslim woman at the lowest rung of the socioeconomic ladder. She ran away from home at 13 and began to perform with Tarab bands. Tarab is the traditional wedding music of the Swahili coast. And over the next six, seven decades, she continuously performed, traveled, toured, walking to many of her own performances, carrying her own drum on her back. And she is now a living legend of Tarab and of Unyago, which is a Swahili woman's dance and drumming ritual, which is used to educate young women about their sexuality. And when I saw her perform, I thought, how many women over the age of 90 occupy this kind of space in Europe or America? How many women's, how many voices and faces and bodies of old women do we see in their full power? She shatters every stereotype we have about the oppression of women in Africa or the oppression of women in the Muslim world. She packs more power than any woman I've seen anywhere in the global north. So I just wanted to bring her to every stage here to wake up some of our preconceptions and bust some of our prejudices. The woman planted a drum on the grass before her. She twisted a soft-worn kanga around her hips, as if she was going to wash clothes, chop vegetables, hike a child to her back to go to market. And none of us really paid any attention. The woman harnessed her hips to the drum, chest high, foot in diameter, msondo drum. She rocked it a slant between her straddled legs. She settled into position, sunken chest, erect, shoulders, neck at the ready, mouth set over gaping gums, kanga hiked up skinny, strong legs. Like it was time to do business, like she was going to work. Suddenly, we are on planet Kidude, where the men scurry across the mat, place mics, arrange wires, jostle for camera views, and the woman ignores them all, because she did this for eight decades, before there were cameras, before there were mics. Decades she hoisted her drum, trudged rich dirt the length and breadth of Tanzania to perform. Decades she fought off terror, insults, mockery. The soul-destroying silence, only the strongest fire survives. Decades she traveled deep and deeper to the heart of her own rhythm. This is B. Kidude, legend of Tarab, veteran of Unyago, woman who at 95 has walked more miles than most of us have driven, claimed a lineage of music rooted in the lives of the powerless, stories unfurled in language of street and market, poetry buried in the bodies of women. I have never seen a woman ride a drum before, like a goddess rides a tiger, like creation rides the cosmos. I have never seen a woman ride a drum like this. I have never seen an artist, male or female, anywhere across the world own her instrument, like it grew out of her belly, like it was welded to her thighs. Then 
there were the dancers. The dancers moved lazily, dropped their cell phones, shook out their kangas, gold at their ears, their necks, their wrists, gold gleamed in their mouths. The dancers slipped into motion as a bajia slips into hot oil, turns and rises to the surface, starts to sizzle. Now the dancers work their hips with a precision of balance, control, a potency of strength, of muscle isolation, Olympic gymnasts would envy. They are working their hips for all of us who have been taught, coerced, to disown our bodies for all women whose bodies have been stolen from them. They thrust their succulent buttocks out with democratic largesse, tease the old woman in the black boy boy, taunt the white boy dreadlock tourist who feigns coolness behind his wraparound sunglasses while I watch his neck turn scarlet, drip with sweat. The dancers shake their hips for the waitresses at Africa House Hotel, caged in the most card awful, ugly, cheap, confining, sweat producing, white shirts, black skirts, to serve drinks to tourists in shorts and bikinis. Because heaven forbid those who serve should ever feel breeze on their skins. Heaven forbid those who serve should move their hips and torsos freely in clothes that flow, in colors that hum. We might forget they are servants. We might see them. The dancers work their hips for the women those waitresses serve. Waxy pale bikini clad tourists at Serena's poolside. Women who check their bodies daily for criminal fat, for outlawed abundance of flesh. Women of the tragic sisterhood of liposuction, surgical alteration, silent epidemic of anorexia deaths. Women taught that beauty equals self-annihilation. The dancers swivel their hips for the 6,000 girl children who today were held down, legs spread, hands tied, gagged, blindfolded, tortured, circumcised. The dancers work their hips for every woman infected with HIV by a man who valued her life less than his gratification. These women who circle Bikidude as planets orbit the sun, circle like temple snakes, sinuous panthers, the source where sound begins. They are shaking the bounty of women's bodies back into the world. Their hips and butts are saying yes. Yes to largeness that does not apologize. Yes to knowledge, power, that do not disguise themselves. Yes to pleasure, claimed and vested in our mortal, beautiful bodies. I will never fear aging again, because now I have heard B. Kidude belt out at 95 without a mic, tobacco stained waves of sound, sandpaper down to coconut fiber stronger than cables of steel. I will never fear aging again, because now I have seen B. Kidude belt out at 95 without a mic. Her face has never touched an anti-wrinkle cream, an age-defying glycolic acid enzyme peel. She knocks back whiskey, cigarettes. For every ounce of moisturizer I consume, she hypnotizes a hundred cameras. I have felt the power of this woman's neck. Her shoulder muscles surge thunder down arm to hand to drum, generate more power than 20 Beyonce's. 10 felakutis with 16 piece bands take us back to the center of fertile creation where sound begins. I believe in Bikidure the way I don't believe in God. But if God were a 95 year old ebony black Swahili woman with a mouth full of broken and missing teeth, a cigarette at her defiant, all-knowing lips, a 10,000 shilling note flapping out of her neckline, hands veined like banyan trees, a drum between her legs. If God channeled irony, lust, contradiction, heartbreak, imperfection, if God flaunted her struggles like a velvet cape, rearranged the atoms of the world with the rhythm of her then maybe I would believe in that God. That God, who is only a name 
for the genius in all of us, that makes us our own imam and prophet, our own divinity. I would call the faithful to prayer, bomba kidude, kidude safi, and they would holler back, safi. They would holler back, safi. They would holler back, safi. And we would all be 